everyone! Welcome to Broken Slippers. I'm your host, Lily Holman. Today, here in professorial glasses, we're doing the opposite of Wonder Woman. I'm putting them on to be hopefully impressive, but <laughs> that's not what we're talking about today. Today, we are talking about Oliver and Company. What's Oliver and Company, you might ask? Or you might be going, yay, Oliver and Company, my favorite. I don't know you. But <laughs> Oliver and Company is the last film to come out by Disney Animated Studios before The Little Mermaid, which, if you've been watching carefully, is the movie that kickstarted the Disney Renaissance. So it's a big step because it's kind of the last step. Um, so the last transitional piece before we get into the Disney Renaissance, which saved the studio. So we need to figure out why this movie didn't kickstart the Disney Renaissance, but we also need to figure out why it's kind of better or farther along the, dis the path than um, Black Cauldron or Great Mouse Detective. So I hope you're into this. Uh, <laughs> if you're unfamiliar with what I just said or what we're doing here, we're studying the unsuccessful Disney movies of the past 30 years and trying to figure out what went wrong and what's salvageable, um, what's worth checking out. So, um, similarly to Great Best Detective, um, not really Black Cauldron, it's, this is a film that's not really maligned but just forgotten. And also similar to Mass Detective is that you get some final steps forward before they crush the musical genre. So it's directed by George Scribner and loosely based off of A Tale of Two Cities. And it's essentially Disney takes Manhattan and brings Billy Joel with them. So Joel himself voices Dodger, who is this kind of charismatic dog that helps the orphan cat Oliver, who's voiced by Joey Lawrence, find his way through the big city. Um, meanwhile, you get some additional star power from, of all people, Bette Midler and Cheech Marin. And the story follows Oliver as he is abandoned as a kitten, adopted by Dodger's motley crew of friends, found and adopted again by a rich but lonely little girl named Jenny, and who then leads a combination of his friends to fight a mobster who is who has kidnapped Jenny and who is exploiting his father figure, Fabian. So a lot of the answers for why Oliver and Company didn't have the success of Little Mermaid um, can be found actually in the opener of the film. Um, so the opener of the film is this really shiny view of New York City, um, and it's hard not to remember that it's New York City in the 80s, and um, you get a really cleaned up look at Times Square, um, and Billy Joel sings Once Upon a Time in New York City. So it's always nice to hear Disney be meta, seeing as this is really based off of a Dickens novel, not a fairy tale. But because of that, it's also a little bit of a confusing line, and it reflects a somewhat unearned optimism of the play itself that will continue in the film as it claims to handle the gritty side of New York, but struggles because it's rated G. You can't have um, you can't have an accurate portrayal of 1980s New York, and that includes some. Um, unsavory aspects. Um, so the opener, oddly enough, is one of the few times where this kind of odd dichotomy is addressed in that it starts out happy and hopeful as all the kittens um, are picked out of this box and adopted by some poorly drawn but adorable children, but all the kittens except Oliver are taken, and as soon as that happens, night hits and everything becomes dark and depressing. Um, at that point, it, that point is acknowledged in the song, and Joel kind of resorts to simply telling Oliver over and over again to keep his dream alive because, quote, that is how the strong survive. It's a really good line, but the futility of this idea is evident as Oliver is almost washed down the sewer, chased down by Dobermans in this really gross alley. Um, and the only reason it seems that he survives is that it's Disney and the most magical studio on earth. And if he didn't survive, well, we wouldn't have a movie. So it's this kind of idea that it's, despite Joel's best attempts, it, New York doesn't seem to be a very pleasant place to be. And the sunny picture painted just a few minutes earlier is pretty much this kind of false ruse. Um, 
And the film tries its best to prove the opposite to us, but kind of like the repetitive nature of the song, it feels like they just keep telling us this rather than proving it to us. Expanding on this idea, I like to think of Oliver and Company as failed Disney neorealism. And yes, part of me just wanted to come up with that term, but it's not too far off, because neorealism was this Italian movement right after World War II that sought to capture the world of the everyman without imposing a Hollywood-esque glamour on top of it. Um, famous films from this genre are, um, from this era are Bicycle Thieves, um, anything by De Sica. Um, and the animators and Oliver seem to have similar goals in showcasing the real New York in as family-friendly a way as possible. Um, so they, the way they do that is after the wheel well incident, Oliver is found by Dodger, who's this street smart dog who shows him the ways of the streets and helps him with a con job and then brings him into this kind of created family of the squatter Fabian. Fabian's human, which is weird to have to specify, but Fabian human. And he's a bit of a complicated character because he's a little bit annoying and he's drawn like you normally draw like a Disney villain henchman and that he has very heavy five o'clock shadow. He's wearing rags and he actually is involved in criminal enterprises. He's leading these dogs in stealing things, mostly because he has to pay off a mobster for something we don't actually know what he did. Um, but the idea is that he has to do all these things to survive. Um, and one of the few things to do, the film actually really truly earns is our affection for Habian, Fabian because one of the film's most moving moments comes during the evening sequence in the gang's hideaway as Fabian reads the dogs a story as they all gather around him and go to bed. So if we, like, if we take for example if you know that Sid from Toy Story is evil because of how he treats his toys, we know Fabian is good by how he treats his animals. The problem is that it kind of exposes that their thesis, like what they're pulling back the curtain on, like a like a neorealist director, is a little bit shallow because all they're really saying is that desperate people can be good too, or if um, Fabian is kind of a figurehead for the side of the city, then it's just like it's deeply misunderstood, and and it's true, but it's it's not a very um, revolutionary message and. Um, it's just, it doesn't give you a whole lot to think about or latch on to or feel like you really learned something coming from the, from the film because I'm assuming you're not horrible elitist who just assume that people in desperate circumstances are bad. Um, so normally I wouldn't attack Disney for like the intellectual richness of their thesis behind the film because that's not normally the goal of the filmmakers. But in this case, um, I think it's partly the goal, which is why I'm, I'm kind of dinging them a bit for it. And it's also the justification for some of the more unpleasant animation. Um, so I just kind of take issue with some of the simplicity behind it and because they've proven recently that you can actually have a family film with extremely intelligent commentary because they made the 2016 film Utopia and it actually won the Oscar, yay! Um, and that film kind of acknowledges a lot of the issues that families who are coming in to watch these films live with every day. So it keeps things shiny and pretty and fun to watch, but it also has metaphors for racism. It deals with sexism. It deals with the intersection of racism and sexism. Um, it deals with different segments of the city coming together and the great things and bad things that come from that. It's a really great movie because it's a really smart movie. Um, and it also managed to do does all do all that with an adventure crime solving narrative on top and it just it it has incredibly delicate writing and it just puts in the effort so that it has a smart movie that respects the intelligence of the audience and also says something larger um so knowing that they can eventually do that i feel a little more justified in um going after oliver a little bit for not doing that before we go way too far down this road, though, I do want to talk a little bit about some of the other elements, like the music, because in this case, it's another step towards the Disney Renaissance musical. But as fine a voice talent as Billy Joel ended up being, they really did hire him for the music. And he's almost a perfect choice if your goal is to celebrate New York in the 80s, because Billy Joel is New York in the 80s. Think Piano Man, Miami 2017, Only the Good Die Young, and for this film, the incredibly appropriate Uptown Girl. Um, but, and Joel's numbers for Oliver are very much in the same vein, um, and they're either numbers celebrating New York, like the, um, 
like the opener or numbers explaining the city, like why should I worry, which we go back to a little bit of the unearned optimism about the city because there are some things to worry about. Um, but And it also has more numbers than the Great Mouse Detective, and they are on a much larger scale than, than Detective. So it's definitely much more of a musical um, and definitely not more of a musical than Black Cauldron. So we're, we're getting back into the genre. Um, and you can even foreshadow, use it to foreshadow the Broadway coming our way um, because Bette Midler has a big number, uh, including a giant staircase. So it's got all these elements that are almost there, but they're still missing the key element of Ashman and Mencken. So they're really fun and catchy, um, but it doesn't have the intelligent layering or emotional resonance of something like Beauty and the Beast. So they're getting there, but still missing the mark a little bit. And lastly, um, the other step they're kind of headed, step that they're taking that's going to get them to the Disney Renaissance is they're starting to embrace star power again, which is double-edged sword when you're talking about animation because so many films use celebrity to just try and sell you a kid's film. So like, um, there are too many examples to count of um, a bad movie getting um, a celebrity voice thrown in so that so that um, families will actually go. Um, so the balance you have to um, reach is something like what Pixar does with Tom Hanks or Amy Poehler where you get a truly fine actor to come in who is appropriate for the character and then also don't overly sell it based off of your voice talent. Similarly, you also have to um, make sure that your ensemble is populated by really excellent character actors like John Ratzenberger and Don Rickles so that you just have this very full picture that respects the art um, but also gives the audience that lovely familiarity. You get in live action films too, like when you watch someone like Cary Grant or Meryl Streep and you're like, I love this person, I'm excited to see them, and it draws you in. Um, so Black Cauldron and Great Mass Detective kind of forgot that lovely familiar aspect of it unless you include Vincent Price. So here we're getting back on that road with the inclusion of people like Billy Joel, Bette Bindler, and Cheech Marin. Um, and also with the inclusion of Midler, it shows that they're starting to turn their eye towards Broadway, which will be huge uh, for the re Renaissance, starting with The Little Mermaid and hitting full speed in Beauty and the Beast when they bring in iconic actors like Jerry Orbach, Angela Lansbury, and Paige O'Hara. So it's really exciting to see them embracing star power, um, and it's, it's a very good signpost for where they're headed next. So, in conclusion, um, the first line of the film that... It's always once a pine in time in New York City. Kind of encapsulates both the great things and bad things about this movie, in that it's kind of got this unearned optimism, this kind of loving view of maybe something that we don't have a whole lot of love for. Um, but it also kind of captures the spirit and the fun um, and the affection the film has not only for its setting but its characters. And in turn, when you have that level of affection for the story you're telling, it's kind of betraying a level of affection for the audience and that's a lovely warm feeling to leave with before we take our um, take the big deep dive into the Disney Renaissance so yeah uh, next time we are going to we are going to see what is life is like post mermaid post beauty post Aladdin like what happens after the genie grants the wishes what what makes the studio stumble again what makes the Renaissance end and how how do how, where do we go next um so i hope you come back to find out we're gonna take a small break for fourth of july and then i'll be back the week afterwards um so i hope you have a lovely holiday and if you are not watching this in real time a lovely week see you next time